The auction and charity fair was the Rotary Club of Taradale's longest running project. From 1968 to 2004, this annual event raised a third of a million dollars, all of which has been used supporting local charities and organisations for the benefit of the people of Taradale and Napier. Year after year, this street will be closed to traffic on a usually warm Sunday morning in March of each year. Down the centre, would be a line of goods, ranging from refrigerators and pianos to small heaters, donated by the public for resale at the hands of expert auctioneers. Lining the eastern footpaths would be stalls selling books, cakes, clothing, fresh produce, plants, electrical goods and raffle tickets. Members' wives and partners, and often family members, would man these stalls. And down here by McDonald's, now the New World Supermarket, would be a vast array of small goods, too small to auction, but which might prize a gold coin from someone who saw value in them. This store area was referred to as the White Elephant, and often the jumble sale area as well, and would often raise as much as $2,000 from what many people might regard as rubbish. But how did it all come together? How did it start? To answer these questions, we have gathered together a group of club members at Ron Ebert's home. These people remember these days, now 40 years ago, when it all started. None more so than past President Yik Ji. My memory takes me back about 40, 40 years. And at that time, John Stitson is our president and Arthur Stedford is the Vice President and I had the privilege of being appointed the Director of International Committee. Doug Ree and Ted Lewis brought up the subject about books for Fiji. A contact over Fiji wanted some textbooks and journals. Doug and Ted brought up an idea and said, we'll set up a sale table at the Taradol shopping centre and raise the necessary fund of $100 to cover the expenses. So the club, the committee approved and we go ahead and we enlarge it into a auction and we had engaged Gordon Walker as our auctioneer and at the meantime all the members authentically go around and take scrounge whatever <laughs> whatever you can and put it on the sale table so it ends up with a big auction on the end of the year, or the March of the Rotary year, and we raised $1,300 for that auction, and the $100 went to the book project. But the rest, we had quite a bit of problem in giving it away. All, all different people all had different idea of how to distribute it. So it ends up with the club forum and, and settle the distribution of that fund. Of yeah, Ted Lewis came back, he'd been up to Tauranga and he brought back this idea of the auction where you had your ordinary auction gear but you also had new equipment from various retailers uh, and we sold and perhaps on a 50-50 basis. It was a chore because the blokes on those stalls had to record how much they'd got and made sure we paid the, the owners a bag. I ran the 1970 auction. All these clothes went to my, my place and we set them all up on racks in the lounge room. And they were there for three weeks. We couldn't use the lounge room and ladies kept on appearing and marking them up because some of them were sold on commission basis. Some were sold 50-50, would go to us, and, and some were sold just anyway. So they all had to be tagged and categorised. So finally when the day arrived for the auction, I um, took all those clothes there, but just before then, it rained the whole week. 
before the auction, and of course you can imagine we had we're in the open, so we were thinking with all the clothing <laughs> and stuff that we've got, what are we going to do? And uh, on the Saturday morning it cleared, fortunately, and so I managed to get all the clothes there, set them up, and we had ladies selling them, but we only made just over a a thousand dollars in 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 that day, but due to bad weather and and the and the mix-ups, I think we did reasonably well. We decided to seek permission from the council to be able to run the auction from the main street where we had the verandas and stuff that we could shelter under should this happen. Was there enough room in the car park? Did it work well at that time? Yes, there was that, enough room for what there, we at had. that time. There was. We've got to remember that the auction over the years has grown and grown and grown and got bigger. And that helped a lot by going into the shopping centre when we had no Saturday morning trading. But we had to change that to Sunday later on on account of the shopping people were going crook about the conflict with the shopping that was going on on Saturday morning and we moved to a Sunday Sunday morning or Sunday. So that, the ladies came in, in quite early, yeah. but it was a hard, quite hard work. Everybody started early, and of course the troops have to be fed. And in those first three years, um, the hardware store at the uh, back of the car park, uh, we had to we set up morning tea tables uh, right down the centre of the aisles. No Saturday shopping in those days, and for the first three years, the ladies gone behind the coffee and the cakes and all the rest of it, and we fed the troops from about 7 o'clock till 11 o'clock. On such and such a day, they'd bring us through, and we might go out with the trucks and pick up lighter stuff. So we'd meet at the shed, and as they were coming off the truck, we would try to sort. Certainly as it got bigger and bigger, it wasn't, it was going out two or three times a night with, you know, with two trailers. Oh, and then we used to just take it up to, to the Tremaine shed on uh, Pukitap Road there. Yeah. Our uh, master here used to sit at the gate and uh, say, this way, this goes there. At least November, we used to go up there every morning and start sorting out things and throwing things out and the ladies used to come up and help us uh, pricing things or, or Rebecca used to take some stuff and take it to the auction in town. Each article was, was priced which um, be, you know was quite a, a large job. It had crowned on the back of the bottom of it and a couple of initials and we sneaked that along to a proper auction and um, came into gold, $200 or something, I think we made for rotary from that. Well, it was mainly my job to check the electronic equipment and uh, we had to check it all over and make sure it was safe and then make sure it did actually go. And uh, um, we spent days and days and days of that. All the stuff we didn't want went down to the dump and the other we put into the auction, which was quite Joel successful. Bought a house lot of um, furniture off somebody who their parents had died and they wanted it to go to Rotary. We got it very cheap, made a lot of money out of it, but we could have made a lot more because there was a little trinket box that the fellow from the second hand shop in Taradale bought and it had a black pearl in it that was worth about $8,000. So there was something we missed out on. We walked into that house, I think it was in Georgistown area, wasn't it? And it was a Scottish family, uh, just a husband and wife, and then uh, whichever one it was that passed away. There was no immediate family here. And whatever, it had been through it and got in contact with the family in, in uh, Scotland. And they said, well, whatever is left, give it to the local Rotary Club, which we got, and Tremaine got this, and we went in to get the furniture. But it was so, so sad, because there was the bed that was still from where the last person came out. I thought that was so sad. Kaitawa benefited from the auction over several times with beds, mattresses and, and I think floor coverings and, and I think cutlery and that sort of thing two or three times. So the concept of the auction changed a lot over the years. Rather than have hours and hours of auction, we, we set up a whole lot of stalls, something like about, I don't remember, about ten stalls. They were donated by Vic Neverman, Neverman. Yeah. and um, where else did they come from? They came from two or three different places. Richard Weir, and they were lovely plants. They were all in boxes, and uh, 
Yes, in the early days with the clothing, we used to wash a lot of the things. Mm. If we saw something that was really good, we'd wash it. Um, Audrey McCarthy um, did a lot of sewing in those days for us and took a lot of the things and mended them for us. We used to go out and pick tomatoes and get about half a tonne of tomatoes. Uh, and uh, Ken Apatu, Apatu Farms, was the guy that give us tomatoes year in, year out. I the raffles and I did that freezer full of meat one time. Roger Alexander gave me a beast one year and you used to always give me a... Didn't uh, Kiltramine and them go out to uh, uh, the beach at Tongoyo there and they shot a whole lot of geese and they brought them in? <laughs> At 5.30am on the morning of the auction and charity fair, members would be up very early. Many bring in their trailers loaded the night before with store goods. Others would help unload the larger trucks, loaded with the heavy auction items, or helping setting up the various stalls. And with security in place, the auction was ready to roll. We had some great times. Uh, the committee meetings were held in Dave Nichols' office and that was an event of its own. But a lot of work went into the auction. The auctioneering, when I first uh, joined uh, Kel, was the auctioneer. And uh, he carried on right through until his untimely death. And then we had uh, Colin Hay, Jim Howard and Peter McLean, local stock agents, came to our rescue. Bargain hunters would be out early, buzzing around the stalls while goods were being put onto the tables. A number were professional second-hand dealers who were quick to spot bargains which they could resell at a profit. The cake stalls were popular and generally sold out early, but as the morning wore on, the remaining stalls would be seen doing steady business and some good-natured haggling would inevitably mean a price would be struck to the benefit of all. By midday, it was all over and the clean-up would be carried out with military precision as large trucks would move in to be loaded with goods to be consigned to the dump. And by one o'clock, thirsty workers would be quenching their thirst at the nearby pub, recalling the funnier events of the day and generally content that a good profit would be realised from their efforts. And I went to the uh, hire shop that we had in Tauro around the corner and hired wigs and uh, clown outfits and so forth when we were on the wheel for the, the meat and what have you, raffles, and uh, give the whole thing a bit of a lift the, with a bit um, of colour. The saints of the auction, I think, were the ladies that were making cups of tea. The ladies from the cruise club, is which was, is... Yes. Um, a uh, widow's club that was formed by one of Rotary members, Ted Ted Mor Dr. Ted Morris. One little carrot at the end of the day which made it quite enjoyable was the aftermatch function. We had it at the Duke of Gloucester, we've had it at Mr Nichols' place, haven't we David? Well the straight after match was at the Duke of Gloucester, we used to go straight after and some used to arrive a lot earlier than others. Yeah, we went to the Masonic one year and Kepi's year I think when you were present. Oh yeah, we used to go to that Chinese restaurant yeah. in Tarragon. So you see it's been a lot of fun all the way through the 40 years, hasn't it? But in 2004, President Alan Tuck, it was the last auction. Why did that happen? <coughs> I think the, um, the, the, the interest from members in the club was waning. And the biggest factor was the fact that we lost a shed at um, Omar and Uwe. That's right. It was get a, to get a bigger shed than what we had at, uh, at Waiheke, it was very, very difficult. And if you had to look for a shed, you'd have to pay for it. And I think that's what stifled it a good bit. From the pickle point of view, we was... Uh, other people jumped on the back of the, of the Rotary auction and they jumped in front of us. And as you go around picking rubbish up, you was, right. you was tending to pick up garden clearances, stuff that really wanted to go straight to the dump. Mm. Plus, at the same time, we were losing the accommodation for the sorting yeah, there's the main at the Waiik, mm -hmm. and that's probably the main reason we had nowhere to put the stuff. Hey, with all the years we had the auction, we had Kells Tremaine shed for years for nothing, and there was only one shed that we had a minimal <laughs> rental was the last two or three years at the Wyhek factory. And we were very, very fortunate with all the sheds we had. We paid little little or no rental in all those years we had the auction. Yeah. Well, it was just the fact that there was also the question, uh, we were running so short of room at Wyhek, they actually had to start up garage sales there yes. as well, no, because no. just in order to create room. Yes. I think the other thing which was also um, 
<coughs> a point worth while mentioning was that for many years, for many years, the uh, it, we have been raising of the order of about twenty thousand dollars a year. It never seemed to increase beyond that, and some kept, and the hours of effort that were going in, uh, the return per man hour seemed to be going down. A lot of money raised for the community, which is what we're all about, and a successful conclusion. Yeah. It was a great effort and, and, and it was a lot of fun. Over its history, the auction and charity fair raised $360,000, a figure which, if you adjust it for inflation, represents $720,000 in 2004 terms. The major recipients were the Town Hall, $41,000, a project whereby the club had supervised the renovation of a historic hall, which is now regularly used by the community. But the Durbell Reserve received $33,000, much of it to fund the magnificent gates at the entry to the park. The Culture Main Memorial Education Trust received $27,000 to help establish the fund so it can support young local students meet the high cost of their tertiary education. Very significant donations were made to Child Health, Palliative Care, the Atafaya Rest Home, the Taradale Library, international projects including the setting up of a computer network for training teachers in Tonga, the Rotary Pathway, and a host of smaller distributions to many other community organisations. It is a record of fundraising for the benefit of the local and international communities that the club can be truly proud. Finally, there was the spin-off of fellowship. The members, their wives and families had a lot of fun doing it. That's what Rotary's all about.